I heard a dad once say he had like eight or nine kids and they like played fiddles and danced and sang. And the youngest was like five doing this stuff. And I was just blown away. Mm. And he said something during their concert that we went to. He said, you got to give your kids a chance to get in the game. Like if your kids are just playing piano all the time and okay, practice piano, practice piano, practice piano. Well, that's okay. But if you have a, if you're in a baseball team and all you're going to do all summer is have a practice every week, yes, that's not going to motivate anyone. Like even a scrimmage to split the team up and let's have a game, but let's actually have a real game against, you know, the enemy town on the other side of the County and let's compete together. He said, we got to give our kids opportunities to get in the game. Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and we can't wait to chat about all things family. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Family Teams Podcast. Excited to introduce you guys to Jason Weening. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Appreciate everything you guys are doing and uh, look forward to talking with you. Yeah, so 10 kids and the span is quite remarkable. They've got one 18-year-old that's off at school and a six-month-old. What life must be like in, in your household with uh, that span is, is, is quite remarkable. So I'd love to hear more about that. But they also were in the Dominican Republic for six months doing missions. Um, but the latest is that Jason's got a book he's working on, a trilogy. And so wanted to hear a little bit more about that. So I want kind of want to start with just the book and then we'll, we'll end. Uh, I want to hear a little more about that towards the end. But yeah, tell me a little bit about what, what brought you guys, what brought you to wanting to, to write a book and tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. We've got 10 kids. Our kids love reading. Uh, like we don't have a TV, so there's lots of reading that happens around here. And they are, we're always looking for good books for our kids. We homeschool them, you know, lots of go to homeschooling conventions, looking through all the exhibits, looking for lamp lighters, got great books. There's lots of great books out there. Imagination Station from Focus on the Family. They read all, all, all those books and the old Hardy Boy books. So we're always just looking for more books. But if you walk through, you know, Barnes and Nobles or whatever your local bookstore is and look for good, look for books for kids, it's a lot of vampires. It's a lot of horror teddy bears. That's the latest craze. And it's like, I think we could do better for our kids than that. And so I've got three boys. I wanted to write something like exciting and fun, short chapters, adventure. And I liked reading the Hardy Boys books growing up. I thought, okay, it's two young guys and uh, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, Hardy Boys. Those were all the <laughs> themes I was trying to channel to, to bring this to life. But also family and dads and sons and older men and sons and like mentoring. It's not just these young boys out in the jungle riding their dinosaurs. That's kind of part of the, uh, of the story, but they've got older men in their family and out of their family that are taking them along for the adventure and hopefully, you know, some mentoring and some older and younger men working together. That was really something I wanted to incorporate. So hopefully I was able to do that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah, definitely needed my, my dad, one of the things he passed down to me was um, the entire collection of Hardy Hardy Boys books that he, uh, you know, it's it's amazing how just generationally that that series has spanned. But it does it does maybe need a little bit of updating. <laughs> so it's it's pretty pretty old school at this point, but it's it's great. Yeah, fun adventures and yeah, I love what you're doing with that, Jason. So, well, I'd love to take a step back and hear a little bit about your family, ten kids, um, and kind of this latest season where you guys are you know, jumping into homesteading, living on some land. Yeah. Take me through just like a little bit about your background and what brought you guys to like be passionate about family and, and build a family like this. Uh, that's a great question. And really we grew up, I grew up in the church. Um, my wife came to the Lord in high school and, um, I had a great family. My mom and dad were awesome. They, my dad told us he loved us. My, he was a great example. So an awesome family. And so we talked about as we were getting engaged and dating, like, hey, maybe we'll have four kids. Uh, that was kind of the number we had in our mind. Started getting involved in looking what we were going to do as our oldest was getting to school age. Growing up, I went to, uh, I was homeschooled for a little while, went to a small private Christian school, went to a big private Christian school, went to a public high school. So I kind of saw the spectrum. Yeah. And we looked around at the current, education system we didn't love but we didn't like what we saw at all at all we're like i think so we started reading learning 
you know, and really came to conviction that parents read through Proverbs, it's father and mother's giving influence and giving instruction to their children. And that really, God brought that alive in our hearts. And we, we just believed God had given parents the responsibility to instruct their kids. It's not the government's responsibility. And, and so we started homeschooling our kids. We began to read more and hear about bigger families and multi-generational families. And I was reading one day, I think it was a book from Nancy Campbell, I think from Above Rubies. I think it was her book. Anyways, it was talking about, we, we read in Jeremiah, in a lot of churches, we hear about Jeremiah 29, like God has plans to prosper you and, and bring you a hope in a future. But just a few verses uh, around that, it's talking about Israel going into captivity and God's telling them, plant gardens, build houses, get your children married, give your sons and daughters a, a, a way in marriage and build families. And it just came alive to us. Like there couldn't be like a worse time in history to be building a family than going into slavery with your entire nation. Mm. And I was like, wow, we live in a cushy time. Why would we not be wanting, why would God not be instructing us to do the same thing mm. and build a family? And that just really came alive in our hearts, Jeremy. And so we decided, you know, okay, Lord, we will just leave our family in your hands and boom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 10 kids later. Uh, oh my goodness. So yeah, that's, that was really how it happened for us. Need a blueprint to revise your family to be a multi-generational team on mission? The book Family Revision by Jeremy Pryor is the book that summarizes all the big picture ideas you hear on this podcast. Available on Amazon or familyteams.com. So that, to me, it's interesting that I think there's been such a divide that people have experienced between um, their family life and their passion for what God is doing in his kingdom. Like these are separate. So, so, so much of, of what we, we see is what we kind of call family and mission, which is sort of like we all do our own stuff individually. Um, and then and family is sort of a separate thing from whatever our calling might be in the kingdom. And so, but what you guys did was to look at those verses and see that, that there's a, there's a sort of a core, um, integration between building a strong family and, and being on mission for the kingdom. And I'd love for you to talk more about like, how, how has that played out? Um, yeah. What are the tensions that you guys have experienced in trying to, you know, bring those two, those two concepts together? Yeah. You know, it's. Like you just said, Jeremy, there's so much individualization in our culture and, you know, the whole family teams concept, like how can we serve God and be a blessing as a family? And that includes my six-year-old son and that includes my 17-year-old daughter. Uh, you know, how that plays out practically, I think as dads is including our kids in like adulty sort of things, you know, and, and going to city council meetings. Well, I brought my 10 year old son to city council meeting. He was the youngest guy there, but, and I asked him before we went, you know, is this look when we're there, who has the influence, who's talking, what's happening and gave him some things to think about while we're there. But I think as dads, we got to really include our kids. If that means you're going away to a business conference, Hey, can you bring some of your kids with you and include them kind of, so it's not just dad going out to the world, doing his thing at his job in his business, but trying to bring our kids into that. So so that's one thing that comes to mind. And also, which is a bit of a struggle with, with 10 kids, yes. all our kids have different skills and abilities, right? So how do we tap into my 10 year old son again? He likes anything with a button or a knob or a screen or a plug, and he wants to take it apart and figure out how it works and push the buttons. And so how can I include him in the music side of things? Because we've got lots of kids that like music. So can he be involved in plugging in the microphones and can he be involved in wrapping up the XLR cords. So mm. trying to reach out with our family, but not just as the parents doing all the stuff, but bringing all of our kids along with us, because I think they're going to catch on to the vision of being a blessing to the world as a family. And it's not just dad or mom or the adults or the big kids kind of doing their thing, but we're doing this together as a team. Yeah, man. And with that spectrum, <laughs> like that, that is so challenging because the needs of these old, your older teen kids, and now you've got all the way down to an infant. Um, there's so such a span there, you know, I would love to hear any, any of the, 
the uh, challenges or um, also just the the different things that have worked for you guys trying to trying to help bridge those those gaps uh, or just manage the tension that's created because I think one thing that's difficult culturally is that people it's so common for kids to grow up in same age cohorts everywhere they go church you know and um, schooling and and so oftentimes I think it's hard for kids to feel like it's normal or natural to have to hang out with their five-year-old when they're a teenager, for example, like these are, and so you guys spent some time in the Dominican Republic actually like doing ministry and or missions with your whole family. So yeah, I'll just take us in a little bit to what have you learned about how to navigate that tension? Yeah. Well, there is tension. Let's not pretend that it's yes. all just <laughs> unicorns and rainbows, you know? Yes. I was telling you before we got, got on, you know, we're experiencing a bit of tension right now. So I mentioned music already and the older kids are involved in music and trying to bring in the younger kids. But sometimes you're dealing with personalities and attitudes and it's like, oh, you're little, you're good at the piano. So can you help your little sister, you know, with the piano? And people are not always gung-ho, you know, to do that sort of thing. So certainly there's a tension and a challenge, you know, practically... Um, when we were in Dominican and we stole this idea from some big family at some point about buddying people up together. And if you've got, you put an older kid with a younger kid, super practically, like in the airport, we all wore red sweaters so we wouldn't lose anyone. Like, have you seen a kid in a red sweater anywhere? He's with us. People were like, Hey, are you a sports team or what? No, we're just, we're just a family, but you know, trying to look at what your kids, what our kids strengths are and try and connect them with a younger one who maybe has those strengths, but even the younger ones, you don't know what their strengths and skills are yet. So just trying to build that relationship between the older ones and the younger ones. We just got back from a art gallery tour at, in town here with a homeschool group. Mm -hmm. And our 15 year old was holding the baby the whole time while mom was helping the kids do their art crafts at the museum. So literally you've got to, my wife and I don't have enough hands to do all the stuff and Someone asked me, what would you do if your wife passed away? I'm like, well, I need someone to help run the organization here. Like it yes. takes all of us to work together. Yeah. And, and talking about the missions thing and the adventure stuff, you know, it's not those big things. I don't think that necessarily make sure they make an impact, but you know, we got to collect the eggs. So my six-year-old son, his responsibility is to go and collect the eggs. And that is, I think that's building the responsibility in him more than, you know, going to help paint yes. a house in Dominican or something like that, because it's a consistent daily thing that I think we need to build in our kids in the small, everyday, mundane, holding laundry part of life, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's huge. Well, and I'm curious, like, as you guys have decided to do more of the homesteading approach, I, it does seem like the larger the family, um, the more intentional you're trying to train your children, there's such an advantage to having that physical labor side of the family, even though it creates all this additional elements to manage, it, it becomes like a sink or swim. It's like, if I don't train my kids or find a way somehow to motivate us all to work, we're all going down together. I'm curious, yeah, what, what kinds of living situations have you guys attempted before this? And then, yeah, what, what was it like making that? Why did you guys make the decision to start to to, to, to actually do more of the homesteading with, with, uh, your whole family. Yeah. So we, uh, we lived out in the country. We had an acre, uh, before we moved, we've got eight acres now, so it's not like this huge farm or anything, but we just got into it little by little. We moved out of town about 10 years ago, bought an acre and started, we got a few chickens and just kind of started small. We didn't know what we were doing. And then we got some goats, we got some beehives and just, we wanted to become a little more independent. You know, we're not like off the grid or anything. It would be great to be, but just getting our own for health reasons as well. My wife is kind of the health department or the food department. And, and so she does a lot of research and stuff and just growing your own things and having your own things can, is just a healthier way to be. So give her all the props for that. And we just wanted to expand a little bit more from our acre. So we literally moved 30 hours across the country uh, to the to the plains uh, where we could get more affordable land. It was a, a financial decision. It freed me up to do a little more of these kind of outside projects of writing and speaking and doing some of this kind of stuff because we could be out of debt. We could have some savings and, and make some of these choices. So 
getting the kids involved is key, but we just wanted to uh, be in a spot where we could teach our kids things. There was like practical, like I just said, collecting the eggs, going to, we've got calves, so the boys got to bring milk to the calves because we don't have a mother for them. So they're mixing milk and bringing it out in buckets. And I just think the kind of home steady life we have so many opportunities to give kids yes. to do to do the work, like it's sink or swim, like you just said, right? So, so it was a step for us. Hey, I realize it's not for everyone, but it's working good. Yeah, man, so cool. I love love that story, and I think it is going to pay massive dividends. Um, and I think that you know this is this is when you described kind of the beginning of your journey. I it really it sounded like look, we're going to trust the Lord. The Lord really says family's good and that's how society is really transformed. Um, go and, you know, plant gardens and have children and multiply um, and just, you know, get into the thick of it. Get get totally overwhelmed <laughs> with uh, with this life and get totally immersed in it. And um, I think the thing that's different and one of the things that you've embraced, and I know that a lot of people, when they picture 10 kids, because of their paradigm, they literally think... Um, you know, as a wife or a husband, the two of us are going to be doing all of the work for the 10 kids as opposed to activating the kids to work together. Um, a lot of people feel very guilty about the idea of asking a 15 year old to hold a six month old, um, like, oh, you're not allowed to do that. It was your decision to have kids. Um, there's a paradigm there that I think is, is very recent. Um, the idea that hard work and sacrificing for your family is a negative unless you're the parent. Um, and that it's always going to somehow traumatize and create resentment. And I think it can, I think some people, I'm sure listening to this, there are people that have had that experience, have, have really had responsibility, um, foisted on them in a way that was unhealthy. Um, but yeah, how do you guys think about, um, calling your children to sacrifice for the family, to do work, um, whether it's on the farm or, you know, helping with the kids, the, the smaller kids. Um, you know, how do you, do you feel guilty? Uh, do you, does your wife, like how have you work through either the philosophy, theology, you know, of uh, what that means to, to, to be like calling your kids to actually do work in the home and not just, um, you know, necessarily for pay outside the home. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And you can go a lot of directions with that for sure, Jeremy, but you know, uh, I already said it. It's not all lollipops and and rainbows because there is there's some pushback definitely at times. And I never honestly have never thought about feeling guilty about it. It was kind of necessity. Like we need you guys to help out around here because I am either at work or doing work. Maybe mom is taking care of the baby. Well, the laundry needs to get done. Dinner needs to get made. Can you help out and? Yes. Sometimes they say yes happily and sometimes they say yes begrudgingly. With that tension, you've, you've mentioned tension a few times and I am feeling that a little bit now as far as, you know, even how far do you push your kids? Is there a line? And when we see the skills and abilities grow, when my older girls are very musical, but they like baking and doing kitchen things as well. And so I volunteered that I volunteered them to make 10 dozen cookies for an event at church the other day. And I came home like, hey, girls. I said you'd make 10 dozen cookies. And they're like, oh, okay. I'm like, you like baking, don't you? They're like, well, yeah. It's only a few more than you'd make just for the family. It can't be that big a deal. But yes. um, but there is some tension there for sure. And for me, it's like, how far do I push them? Because I see there as dads, Jeremy, you know, we see, I think we recognize the talent in our kids more than they recognize their own things. It's like this. Do I push them? They need a piano player at church on Sunday. I know you don't really want to play, but you can do it and it will be a great opportunity and you'll be a blessing to other people. It's not just about you. So yes, the tension I'm struggling with is how do we, how far do we push our kids and how much, because like you mentioned, I don't want them to grow up and resent that dad was always, you know, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. Look, I love you kids, whether you do it or don't do it, but I also want to call you, call your gifts out to be a blessing to the world and to the kingdom right. and to grow the kingdom. Yeah. It's, it is a tricky it's a very tricky um, balance there. You know, it's interesting because it, you you ask parents who are completely against asking your children to do any work around the home or to help the family in any way, um, uh, then they, the same parents will be completely fine with demanding that their child 
you know, um, does their math homework or reading or so it's not that, that there are some fa parents who don't have expectations and, um, and, and expect their kids to do these things and others that don't, it's just a values question. Like what, what do you value as a family? And so if you're, and I, particularly when I think about my daughters, I'm like, okay, society is saying to all of my girls that you need to spend all this time studying math because somebody you know, 60 years ago, saw that we were falling behind the Russians and they made a decision about the amount of math that needs to be in the curriculum so that we can churn out a certain percentage of, you know, qualified people. And so, yeah, my girls are all, you know, slaving away over <laughs> these worksheets. Um, but it's not okay for them to, to do something that helps around the house that actually is perfectly in line with what they're likely to actually do when they get older. And that is they all want to pursue being mothers. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of this guilt, and I'm glad you guys don't feel that. Um, I, I do think it's important to um, really be connected with your children's hearts to know where that line is. I don't think that that, that line is uh, discernible um, just as a some kind of cookie cutter formula. Like you're not going to say, oh, as soon as you require more than three hours a week of your children, you know, service in the house, then you cross some magical line. No, no, no. Like, like, there is a lot, there is a, there is a give and take. And part of why I'm a big fan of doing family meetings and one-on-ones is to be very dialed in on each child and say, okay, are we crossing a line here? Um, am I pushing you too hard or am I pushing you not enough? Um, you know, and are we calling you and setting a vision for why you'd be inspired to serve in these different contexts, as opposed to just like, you know, keeping responsibilities on you without actually, you know, allowing you to experience the goodness of those opportunities. Sometimes like, okay, this, yeah, I think this realm of things you probably do need to be compensated for. And, um, you know, that, those kinds of things. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky thing. And I think when you have 10 kids and you've got a homestead, um, it's so, uh, critical that, yeah, we don't fall into, I guess, either extreme, uh, doing all the work and expecting your kids just to, you know, uh, do nothing or, demanding so much of your kids that there's a resentment that's brewing in the family. But man, that, that is a, that's always a challenging balance. I think I was excited to get, yeah, your, your thoughts on that. The family plan calendar is the new way to keep your family team organized. Plan your rhythms, menu, household chores, and notes for the family all in one place. Visit familyteams.com to purchase. So the uh, last thing I wanted to Approach with you, Jason. I, I I'm really curious how in the world with your schedule you wrote a book. <laughs> um, we we had a conversation as uh as dads on a call I had a couple of days ago about um, inspiring creative output in the home. You know, you know your some of your kids have, you know, your kids are born and some of them just have this this creative drive, right? It could be musical, it could be you know like drawing and painting. It could be drama, you know, there's so many different um, out outlets and certainly writing a novel requires a lot of creative energy um, and focus, you know, and there's a ton of resistance. I mean, some somebody who's single and trying to write a novel um, is going to endlessly talk about how difficult it was. And so I'm like looking at a dad with 10 kids who's just successfully written and published a novel and ho hopes to do more. So I loved it to hear about, you know, yeah, your creative process, how in the world do you get the focus? Um, and then like, how do you inspire that in your children? Like, is there anything you've learned about, um, how to help your kids, um, experience uh, some creative outlets in their own lives? Yeah. Uh, good question, Jeremy. Uh, first of all, little, little bit at a time, I think is how, is how I did it. And I would go to the library and I would write for an hour. That was my goal. And I did that over a period of months and months and months. And I would, I had a word out. I can't remember 500 to a thousand words. I think that's what my goal was Good. 500 to a thousand words a day and just little, 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 an hour a day over a long period of time. And it didn't work out exactly perfect like that, but yeah. you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Right. So <laughs> little by little by little, I would have loved to have like a month just to not do anything and, you know, I'm going to write a book, but yes, that isn't my reality. And it's probably not most people's realities. But also including, I included my kids and I'm like, guys, what do we hmm. talk about? What happens here? This is happening to the character. They're attacked in the jungle. What happens next? Here am I? Oh no, don't do that, dad. Don't do this. So hmm. I kind of included them in the creative process. I'm like, what is the title? What's, what's it going to look like? So they were actively involved. It was definitely a team effort to do it. Um, so trying to do that. 
Musical, we got, we've talked a lot about music. Our kids, my oldest, my second oldest daughter, she just is very creative, like crocheting and like art. She draws and she does piano. And she's just like, I'm shocked at the skills that this girl has that she didn't get it from me. Maybe she got it from her mom. But giving her opportunities, I heard a dad once say he had like eight or nine kids and they like played fiddles and danced and sang. And the youngest was like five doing this stuff. And I was just blown away. Mm. And he said something during their concert that we went to. He said, you got to give your kids a chance to get in the game. Like if your kids are just playing piano all the time and okay, practice piano, practice piano, practice piano. Well, that's okay. But if you have a, if you're on a baseball team and all you're going to do all summer is have a practice every week, yes, that's not going to motivate anyone. Like even a scrimmage to split the team up and let's have a game. But Let's actually have a real game against, you know, the enemy town on the other side of the county and let's compete together. He said, we got to give our kids opportunities to get in the game. And mm -hmm. so for us, that is music a lot of the times, um, but it could be sports for your kids. It could be other things. It could be art in town. It could be, there's so many things, whatever your kids are, give them opportunities to use those skills. Yeah. And again, the, the balance, like, Try not to push them too much, but trying to still push them a little bit and just say, hey, I see this gift in you. Let's be a blessing to the world with mm -hmm. that gift. I love that. Man, so good. Yeah, we need to have families that create together. I just love the image of like, yeah, you telling a chapter of the story and getting real-time adventure feedback. I, I have had this dream of, of like family albums, family books, like, like literally like collaborating across families. One of the things we're trying to do I have a daughter who's also super into crochet, super into painting, just wants to create, create, create. And I, I, I told her, to your point about getting in the game, I feel like so much of what, you know, kids do, whether it's, you know, just practicing a musical instrument, um, the, that's why the recitals are really important. And why can't families yes. do that more often? Like, why can't we have a family concert and just, just say, guys, you're going to hear where our family's at. You know, this one's written some songs. This one's been practicing the piano, like come and hang out with our family and like, let's, Let's have a night of music and, you know, and snacks or whatever. One of the things that we're trying to do for leading up to Christmas is like an arts and crafts show. That's just our family and, uh, and friends and our extended family that my, my daughter, Lisa is trying to, you know, put together and say, okay, everybody can have a booth. And again, I think, I think so much of our assumption about artistic, um, expression is that for it to go public, for it to be behind a mic, it's got to be at this incredibly high level because now we live in this world in which you know, we do see the world, only the world-class best at everything. Um, and that's not really not, that wasn't the way families used to be, right? Families were like, you were locked into your village. And if there was one family that was musical, they would provide the music for the, you know. Um, and so we need to get back to, to something that's more family-sized um, so that our kids can get in the game. I think that's a really, really good word. But that's, that's, our kids need to get that kind of encouragement um, that, that if they're ever going to get to a, a higher level, in their, in their various creative, um, uh, attempts, then, then yeah, we've got to, we got to start. I think one of the things a dad can do is just sort of set up the game and say, here's the game, you know, six months, you guys are all going to put on a play, you know, or in, in 12 months, you know, we're going to have a house concert. So everybody keep, keep practicing. And then every week I'm going to check in with you guys and make sure that you're, you know, advancing, advancing, advancing and getting ready for this, because this is going to be a really fun thing. We want to, we want to really bless our, our friends. And, um, yeah, I love that. I love that you were, um, as you're writing the book, it reminds me of, I'm a huge Tolkien freak. I've got all these Tolkin books see him behind me here. Yeah. You see, yeah, it's like, um, you know, he, he was similar, Jason, like he, he was, uh, out there constantly talking to his kids and his, his son, Christopher about the di different adventures. And he was his, you know, his, his main cre kind of creative collaborator, um, wow. was his son. Um, and he actually brought Christopher Tolkien to the Inklings. And so he was a part of the Inklings, mm -hmm. um, got to hang out with C.S. Lewis and, all those guys. And so like what you're describing, like as a father, sometimes I'm, I, I feel like fathers need to take ground creatively and then bring their kids behind them. And what, what, what yes. it must be like to be your kids, like seeing you publish a book, um, you know, hearing the feedback, you know, having their friends read. I mean, it's going to be a, a really cool experience for your, your whole family um, that you're creating. So I love it, man. Like what um, you said, Jeremy, about, I'll just point it out because I think it's so important is we live in this production like world, like everything's got to be perfect. And I think part of getting our kids in the game is that you're going to hit a wrong note. You're going to yes. make a draw a bad picture. You're going to write a bad story that someone's not going to like. 
And now you're going to learn how to deal with it. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to be bad, but we've got to be bad before we're good. And we just keep working at it. And it's okay to make mistakes and it's not going to be perfect. And that's totally okay. We're growing. We're learning. Yes. Just get in the game. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that they've discovered about the people who have had the greatest creative achievement is they just have a lot more output. Um, and so if you get discouraged early on and you, your output goes, you know, through the floor because you feel like it has to be perfect. That's what creates writer's block. That's what really causes people to lock up creatively. I love your pattern of just going to the library, 500, a thousand words a day and just be, be faithful, be diligent, like, you know, have some discipline, show up, be a pro and get this thing done. And, um, man, what comes at the end of it is just amazing. So, um, this has been a super inspiring, uh, Jason, what, where can people find the book? Um, tell us a little bit more about how to get, get a hold of it. Sure. Yeah. So it is on Amazon. It is called danger in the jungle. Uh, it is written for an eight to 12 year old kind of demographic is what I was shooting for there. I've read it to my younger kids and they love it too. But, uh, my website is heydads.ca. It's got links to some of the stuff as well, but danger in the jungle is on Amazon and you can get it right there. Excellent. Thank you so much for uh, jumping on here today, Jason. So good to meet you. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.